Hello, and thank you for watching Science360 Genetic Engineering. Today we are going to talk about genetic engineering and how it is helping us fight the disease diabetes. There are two types of diabetes. The process that we'll discuss today is important for both types, type 1 and type 2. But we'll spend most of our time talking about type 1 diabetes. This is sometimes called childhood diabetes. In childhood diabetes, something goes wrong with the immune system. Our immune system is sort of like a police force for our body. Whenever something dangerous, like a virus, comes in, our immune system kicks in and protects the body. But in childhood diabetes, the immune system gets the wrong guy. When someone has childhood diabetes, their immune system attacks the cell in their own pancreas. These cells are very important because they produce a molecule called insulin. When a diabetic person's body stops producing insulin, they become very sick. If they don't receive treatment, they could die. Fortunately, doctors can give diabetic patients new insulin to inject into themselves. If they receive insulin regularly, then people with childhood diabetes can live fairly normal lives. So what does any of this have to do with genetic engineering? Well, when doctors first began using insulin, they had to get it from cows, along with some other farm animals. But insulin was hard to get from animals. First, the animal had to be slaughtered. Then its pancreas was removed. A scientist could extract a little bit of insulin from this organ. We needed a better way to get insulin, and genetic engineering provided one. This new way involved some bacteria that lived in our gut, some tiny loops of DNA called plasmid, and a remarkable property of the genetic code that we'll hear more about later. But let's start at the beginning. We all have DNA in each of our cells. DNA is shaped like a double helix. Think of a ladder, except the DNA ladder is twisted around into a spiral. Those rungs that you see store information. Each rung is like a letter and a code that our cells know how to read. The genetic code is divided into segments called genes. Each gene tells our cells how to make a protein. There are many different types of proteins. Proteins make up our muscles. Proteins produce the pigments in our skin, hair, and eyes. Proteins digest our food, and proteins let our cells talk and listen to each other. In short, proteins are the workers that let our cells function. Oh, by the way, insulin, the star of this show, is also a protein. This brings us back to the remarkable property of the genetic code that I mentioned earlier. It turns out that with very few exceptions, the genetic code is shared by every living thing on the planet. Think of the genetic code like the writing in a book. Even though there are many different books, you could read any one of them if you knew how to read the writing. Similarly, since all genes are written with the same genetic code, a cell could read any gene that we gave to it, since it knows how to read the code. Now we're ready to discuss genetic engineering. Genetic engineering is the insertion of DNA into the cells of an organism to produce a desired result. The universality of the genetic code makes genetic engineering possible because it means that if we take a gene like, oh, I don't know, the gene for insulin, and place that gene into the cells of another organism, then that organism can make insulin. This process requires genetic engineers to cut DNA at specific places. To do this, they use molecules called restriction enzymes. These are sort of like molecular scissors. By choosing the right restriction enzyme, genetic engineers can cut a DNA molecule wherever they want. So we know how to cut DNA, but what if we wanted to place, say, your favorite gene into a DNA molecule? Genetic engineers use another molecule called ligase to paste pieces of DNA together. Now we have some new knowledge and some new tools. We know that the genetic code is universal and we know how to cut DNA and paste the pieces back together. This is all we need to know to produce all the insulin we could ever need. And better yet, we can make human insulin, none of that bovine stuff. Genetic engineers chose a type of bacteria 
called E. coli. You may not be familiar with E. coli, but you have colonies of them living in your colon right now. Why did genetic engineers choose E. coli? One reason was that it's easy to grow lots of these bacteria. Another reason was simplicity. This six foot long string is about as long as the DNA in just one human cell. That's a lot of DNA. Long pieces of DNA like this are difficult to work with because they would break or be cut in the wrong place by restriction enzymes. On the other hand, how much of this yarn will it take to estimate the length of E. coli's DNA? An inch? Half a foot? Actually, it turns out that all the DNA in an E. coli bacterium would be only about one millimeter long. In fact, we can do even better. Many bacteria contain even smaller pieces of DNA called plasmids. These plasmids are very useful because their small size makes them simple and easy to work with. So when a genetic engineer wants to place a gene into a bacterium, they usually add it to a plasmid first and then place the plasmid into the bacterium. Let's try to do some genetic engineering of our own. These beads represent DNA. This is some human DNA, and here's the insulin gene. This is a loop of plasmid DNA. Our first job as genetic engineers is to break the insulin gene out of the human DNA. We'll use a restriction enzyme for that. And while we're at it, we can open up this plasmid. Now we need some ligase enzyme to put this back together. Remember that ligase links the ends of DNA back together. The only thing left now is to place this DNA into a bacterium. Now the real process is a little bit more complicated than this. We're not interested in the details right now. So that's the story of how we got a stable supply of human insulin. That's good news for cows, and it's great news for the people with type 1 diabetes. But insulin is just the tip of the iceberg. The universal genetic code has possibilities for all sorts of applications. Scientists can already create genetically engineered lab animals for research and add genes to crops to give them traits like insect or herbicide resistance. Many people worry about the safety of such uses of genetic engineering, particularly when it affects our food. However, it is likely that we will continue to see novel uses for genetic engineering well into the future. All of these developments are fascinating, so maybe one day we'll do a program on them. And thank you all for watching Science 360 Genetic Engineering, a production of Moorhead Planetarium and Science Center.